What's up, YouTube? It's me, the Artisan MC, and today I'm going to review Last of Us Episode 7, Left Behind. Now, I just finished watching this episode. Um, episode 7 picks up after, obviously, Episode 6, where Joel has fallen off the horse and is bleeding because he was stabbed with a baseball bat handle in his gut. We find that uh, Ellie has somehow gotten him all the way to this abandoned house that was, I guess, nearby, and dragged him down into the basement, laying him on a mattress, and Joel was in a bad way. And he is telling Ellie to leave him, to go north, go to Tommy, and leave him there. And while she does not want to do it, she eventually makes her way up the stairs out the basement to do it, and then freezes solid, stops in one place thinking about something. Now, while she stopped on the stairs, she has a memory. And this is where the bulk of our episode picks up. With seeing Ellie back in the QZ before she ever met Joel or anything like that, you get to see a little bit of her life in the QZ. That she was basically like a um, boarding school girl being raised by Fedra. They still had gym class and all the rest of that goofy shit, but she was actually being pushed, in a sense, or groomed to become Fedra. Now, this is a far cry from where you saw the first episode where there were just kids wandering around, showing up infected and getting thrown on the, the like another shrimp on the Barbie on the Pyrie. These kids, a bunch of girls, gotta have that in there, are being trained to be officers or people in Fedra to help keep all of this running. And you actually get the Fedra point of view on this whole thing for how this episode plays out, which is what you see is a difference in ideologies, right? You get the Fedra ideology given by her headmaster or captain, whatever the hell he is, Asian dude that sees a little bit more than Ellie because she's so smart. She's so stunning. She's so brilliant. She's so brave. He sees leadership in her. I saw, you know, why does this chick have a Walkman in 2023? Where did she get it from? She wasn't even born during the time that these were a thing. How did she find this? I don't know, but she has one. I'm also seeing how do you see the chick that's getting into fights and had somebody fighting for her the whole time become the leader? or have a leadership quality, because she can have somebody else fight for it. I believe in this scene that the headmaster or captain, I can't remember what his rank was, belief in Ellie is misplaced and it's not given over anything. It's not proven out over anything. Because up to seven episodes of this, all we've proved is Ellie has the ability to use fuck in many different ways, or say it, as the base of most of her language. So from here, you get that Ellie has a friend, a roommate, and in her room, she cannot sleep because the other corner of her room is completely empty. The bed is there, it's made up, but no one is there. This would be because her friend is missing and has been missing for a while. And while Ellie goes to sleep that night, someone creeps in the window and then puts their hand over her face. And Ellie wakes up to see her friend, Riley, who has come back, who in fact is not dead. She's just been gone. She just ran away for three weeks. Now, Riley is played by Storm Reed, and I believe this is the girl from A Wrinkle in Time. I'm pretty sure that's the, the same girl. So they got her in another movie really quickly. I don't have anything against the girl, but I think it's interesting how they keep throwing her in there. What roles they pick to give her, what role she picks. Now, Riley tells Elle she joined the Fireflies. Ellie doesn't believe her. 
And Riley pulls up her shirt to show her a pistol in her shorts, which proves all of nothing to me besides you got a pistol. But she wants Ellie to sneak out with her at 2 o'clock in the morning to have the best night of her life. A little persuading, Ellie does it. And now they're out in the world, sneaking around under Fedra's nose, going out to have a night on the city, I guess, or a night on the QZ. And what you get is the establishment that these two are really close friends. Um, Riley has taken a different path than the one that growing up in Fedra QZ has laid out for her, and she's actually picking her own path, and that some of the stuff that Ellie has heard from Fedra is not true. And some of the stuff said by Fedra about the Fireflies is not true. And that's a little clash of ideologies, but what you find out is that as much as Fireflies can say what the Fedra says is propaganda, the stuff that the Fireflies say is propaganda too. It's just propaganda in a different direction because it's all propaganda, right? So both the people in the middle got two sides of two different stories. That's basically it. And one believes more than the, one story more than the other one because it falls in line with its values or whatever. It's just the way it goes with people. One of the things that Riley wants to show Elle is a place. And that because there's more people coming to the QZ, it turned on more power, spread out to some more apartments. But what Riley wants to show her is underground in this other place. And once they get down to this underground place, they see that power is restored here as well from restoring the power up on the block. And what it does is it lights up an underground mall, shopping mall. Now, this seemed like a bad fucking idea to me. In a zone with all burnt out apartment buildings and all that kind of shit, that's dark as fuck, these two goofy motherfuckers went out there and turned on every light in the shopping mall. Now, they do try to cover it up inside the episode with Riley saying that you can't even see it from here is built like a bunker. That's not how malls are made. Malls are made to have that central corridor in that one show the most light, which means it would be a lot of glass up on top of there so they can have natural light. It's not built like a bunker. But be that as it may, maybe the people watching the shit had never been to an actual mall. I don't know. But beyond that, she restores power to this whole mall and decides to take Ellie on a little tour of the mall and these stores and all the rest of that. Now, while this can be considered really cool, there's a really weird vibe going on with this stuff. Okay? Really weird vibe. Now, the part that I miss is before they got to the mall, they went through an apartment building and they came across a dead body of a guy who had a bunch of pills and some old alcohol. Not moonshine, some old alcohol. They took it. They swigged it a little bit. Why they swigged it, I don't know. If a guy is dead next to a bottle, an open bottle, I would assume whatever he killed him was in the bottle. I wouldn't be drinking that too. But these two goofies go ahead and drink the shit. So now they're getting you know, hyped up on some old alcohol. So by the time they get down here to this mall, they feel some effects, okay? Now they get to this mall and they're looking at all these different stores and they go past one store, which is a Victoria's Secret store. And the character of Riley is having this, you know, inconsequential conversation about stuff with, with Elle. But then they stand in front of the shopping store window and says she couldn't imagine Elle in this. And I'm like, ooh, problematic. Now, that was cringe as fuck to me. Reason being is this whole 
situation now seems like a fucking date. Seems like a date. I'm just waiting for somebody else to realize that L ain't as smart as the, the headmaster was saying, because she ain't picking up on none of this shit, apparently. This is a fucking date. Why it's a date, I don't know. But it's a fucking date. Now, the reason why that line is so cringe is because if this is a date, who would take their date out to a shopping center and position them in front of the Victoria's Secret model dummies with the lingerie on and tell them, I couldn't picture you wearing this? How old is she supposed to be? 15? This seems like we're laughing about it during the watch party, but at this point, this seems like some grooming shit to me because it has all the elements already there. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, you got her alcohol? You took her out? You can't see her wearing such and such? What do you want her to do? Disres disagree with you and go put it on? The fuck is this? That shit made me laugh because... If you reverse that situation and put a guy in the Riley role, everybody on the internet would be talking about how fucking ridiculous it was, how cringe it was, how he was objectifying her. But smarter than the average bear, I get it. It's okay if women objectify other women. Men just can't like women. I get it. So they go on with the date. And as they go on with the date, and as I will call it a date from here on out, they get into some other tropey, stereotypical, you know, date type stuff. You know, he, Riley finds a carousel right after the Victoria's Secret so they can get on the carousel and ride the carousel. And I'm just sitting there thinking these girls, these two girls are obviously going to be into each other. And now they get to have a pole between their legs. Like, what the fuck? Like, what am I watching? Is this legal to be on television? These supposed to be teenagers, right? Now, I called it after the Victoria's Secret scene, and then you get to the carousel. When I, I told the person in the chat for the watch party, he's like, shit, all we need now is the Polaroid. Where's the Polaroid at? And sure enough, while they're riding this goddamn carousel, when it stops inexplicably, for some un unknown reason, Riley informs Ellie there's one more thing. But, but, but wait, it gets worse. Yes. And what is it in the background? A photo booth. Oh, yes. That favorite of every carnival <laughs> and amusement park. The three shot photo booth. And I'm watching this like, oh, this is bad. And not bad as like it's never happened before, but it's just fucking cringe. Because I don't think this is how you come out to your friend that you gay and like them. I don't think this is how it works. I don't think so. Don't think that's how it works. Even if they both feel at each other, this seems really silly. Really silly. And half the time while I'm watching them, trying to put out my mind that this was written by a grown man. Trying to remember that, but okay. Now, the the usual tropey stuff happens. They get in the photo booth, and they take some ridiculous pictures. And one picture gets them a little close, and there's a little bit of lingering on their closeness. It's like, okay, yeah, so she obviously all in her. Now, the episode goes on with them making a shitload of noise in this mall. Even though the mall has supposedly been sealed off for because it was filled with infected, there is no infected down here, and it's not really sealed off. It's still making a shitload of noise, right? And to cap it all off, they find themselves in an arcade with money and coins still in the machine 20 goddamn years later. And they get in there to play in a little bit of Mortal Kombat 2. Now, why these chicks know how to play this shit, I don't know. Because this would predate the infection and where they are by about 30 goddamn years. 
I don't know why either one of these teenage girls born after this shit would know anything about it. I really don't know. I don't know how they would. But some kind of inexplicable way they do. And they get to play Mortal Kombat and pull off some of the finishers. Oh, shit. That's amazing. Now, while I laughed at Mortal Kombat being in here, I had to remember that Mortal Kombat is owned by Warner Brothers. That's why it's in here. The product placement was in there somewhere else, too. But you have them in there making all this extra fucking noise. Pinball machines going off them and they're screaming like little girls do when they have excited and having a good time. And lo and behold, down the hallway... Those sounds travel to the ear of an infected, and the infected wakes up. Fun times, right? Now, they do a little bit of uh, my first love, karate kid type of bullshit, you know, golfing stuff, playing around, and they end up finding out that the reason why Riley brought Ellie out this night was that Riley was leaving. Riley was getting shipped off to Atlanta and she wasn't going to be in Boston anymore. This was her last night in Boston. And the only person that she was thinking about back in the QZ was Ellie. And she wanted to see and be with Ellie that night. Now we already got a little bit of more grooming vibes here because you get back to some other things that Riley wants to show Elle and it's, um, where Riley, sorry, where Riley sleeps in this taco bar, her little bed laid out on the floor, and her bombs on the shelf. Now this is really fucking suggest suggested to me because she took the girl past where she sleeps. This was gonna be problematic. Now, I was wondering how far they was going to go with this episode, because I already seen two, two hairy-bearded men laying up in the bed together, you know, spooning up and going down on each other. So I'm kind of like, what the fuck is going on next? Now, Ellie sees the pipe bombs and kind of gets charged, charged up at Riley about it, because as far as she knows, Fireflies use those bombs to kill soldiers. And Riley is saying they, she would never let them do that to L. And Riley, I mean, L rightfully says, how could you stop him? I said the same thing. You're a grunt. You ain't stopping shit. You're not. you following orders. Just like L would be following orders. So L gets pissed and she leaves. And we move on to the scene. Halfway out of the mall, Elle decides to double back and speak to Riley again. And when she does, she finds Riley in a Halloween store. And Riley goes on to part four of her plan to have a good night with Elle, which is now they are now dancing on top of these glass cases in the Halloween store with masks on. Now, to me, I thought this looked really weird. This looked like a teenage girl striptease or something was about to go on. Like she just wanted to dance for her. And the song they were playing was um, I Got You, Babe. And I'm like, get the fuck out of here. It's like so much ridiculous subtext going on in this shit. Like, oh God. If I didn't know that these characters were into each other, I would know these characters were into each other. I would. I totally know where this was going. And sure enough, it goes where you think it's going to go. In a minute of realization and a breathless pause, they end up kissing. And I'm like, this is child pornography, right? Because that's what I was thinking when I saw that. This is, aren't these supposed to be underage girls? And aren't they actually underage girls? Am I allowed to be watching this shit? This is illegal, right? Be that as it may, that's what happened. They get a little, little, little lip nectar on each other. 
and all of a sudden we got an infected showing up. Yes, that's how it happened. Now, infected buses in, and they trying to run for their life, and Riley is busting shots at the infected and gets knocked down and, and out for a minute. And the infected is fighting with um, Ellie, but not biting her yet. They just tussling and shit like that gets thrown into some other shit and gets free. And Riley, you know, comes to, goes after Riley again. L comes up, saving Riley, stabs the damn infected in the head with her switchblade. And it's down. And then we get the reveal of the shocking part of this episode. Ellie is bit. This is the first bite that Ellie received. And not only is Ellie bit, Riley is bit too. Now, it doesn't matter in the scene that you never saw either one of them get bit at all. Didn't see a, a, a moment where they could have been bit. Didn't play out that way. But they're both bit. Now, whereas Ellie freaks the fuck out and goes, you know, uh, Michael Jackson, you know, on these display cases and shit like that. Um, Riley is reserved and tearful and holding on to what she wants. And what she wants is to be with Elle. She wants to be with Ellie. And she wants to be together as a couple with Ellie instead of dwelling on the fact that she's gonna die. She knows everybody's gonna die. We're all gonna die. But she wants to spend the time that she has left with Elle which could be kind of heartfelt in that scene. It could be. Since she had already did all this other stuff that still, still really rubs the, the grooming vibe to me. Alcohol, date, pictures, carousels, everything the girl likes. Sound like a setup. All right. Victoria's Secret, showing you where you, she sleeps. Well, bad inferences that if there are so many bad inferences, if you put a guy in that role, you would say it was really strange. It was really creepy that he was a creep. He was setting her up to get banged out. But I guess it's okay if it's just females doing it. I guess. Now, Elle admits that she wants to be with Riley. And the two of them sit on the floor holding hands. And the episode cuts away back to Joel laying on the floor in the basement and Ellie standing on the steps about to leave him. What you find is that Ellie does not leave. Instead, Ellie starts ramshackling the house looking for something. And what she finds is a roll of thread. And she goes back downstairs to Joel and shares a look with Joel like she cares or he's happy she didn't leave. This is how I took it because he clenches her hand tight and then looses up and Ellie goes in with this needle and thread to start sewing up Joel's wound. Now, there is no disinfecting. There is no alcohol. There is no cleaning the wound off, cauterizing it like I would have thought, burning with something. Nope. She just start, you know, Dry stitching his ass. Infection be damned. If only he only had a piece of painted wood shoved in his stomach. I mean, why try to disinfect it at all? But that's what happens, and that's the end of the episode. We get to see Ellie stitching up Joel when we didn't get to see Ellie getting bit by a fucking infected. No, we can see her, you know, doing a little, little flesh tickling with a needle. And that's the end of the episode. And for me, I don't know, I was cracking on the episode too much, maybe. But some of this shit was just reading really silly to me. I mean, at a point in it, I really did wish I was watching the other episode with Bill and Frank. Because at least that was handled better. Seemed like some actual grown-up shit was happening. Regardless if I like it or not, if it's my cup of tea or not, it was handled a little bit better. This was kind of comical. It was too easy to laugh at this shit. And I've been a teenager before. Even as a teenager, this would have seemed cheesy and silly. 
Like, Jesus Christ, who wrote this shit? Do you understand anything about, you know, relationships, interactions? Because you can't tell me this girl is super smart one minute and she's dumb as fuck the next and don't understand what's happening here. But that's the Mary Sueism. You only have what you need at the time. And any other time, you don't have it at all. It's not relevant. So it's not the most egregious sense of the character having an ability and losing the ability in the same episode, but it did happen. It did happen. Um, regardless of this episode, I still enjoyed it. It was still fun because it made me laugh a bit at how silly it was, but all of it was telegraphed. It was, it was a cliche episode, a cliche date episode. It's like, that's why I mentioned Karate Kid. It could have been just as silly as that. All they needed was a better soundtrack. Call up Christopher Cross. I think he's still alive, but that's it for me. Um, that has been my review of episode seven of The Last of Us, Left Behind. It did leave some stuff behind. It wasn't a terrible episode, but it made me laugh more than take it seriously. But I'll still be watching it. I still like the series. So I will catch you guys next time. Peace. <laughs>